On this episode of Warbird Radio Presents, we're going way back in our archive to one of our earliest broadcasts, talking to the late Roy Reed, a B-17 pilot, on his way to the Philippines with a quick stopover in Pearl Harbor. The only catch is it's December 7th, 1941. Mr. Reed has the distinction of being one of the first American airplanes shot down during World War II. But his career is nothing short of incredible. Stories of Pearl Harbor, Poncho Barnes, and even Curtis E. LeMay, they're all here on this episode of Warbird Radio Presents The Roy Reed Story, right now. Where did all of this begin, this, this great flight to Pearl Harbor, which you thought was just simply a PCS out to the Philippines? How, how did this all begin? Yeah, well, it uh, began probably the, the particular, this particular leg of our journey two days before Pearl Harbor, where we were stationed at, at Albuquerque, New Mexico, which was the first uh, big station for uh, B-17s. Uh, that had been built specifically for B-17s. And uh, we were in a, a squad, or I was in a squadron, uh, which was a reconnaissance squadron that worked with a 19th bomb group. And we did all the reconnaissance work and uh, and some bombing also. But anyhow, uh, we got orders to go to... Uh, the Philippines to augment the Philippines, and we'd gotten them oh, a month or so before. And uh, we, we uh, were getting our planes ready for the final trip over, and we were going to San Francisco. <clears throat> Excuse me. And uh, one of the one of the funny things was, or at least it was funny in in retrospect, was the last day we were at Albuquerque. They came and installed armor plate behind the pilot and the co-pilot. And uh, it looked uh, <laughs> like it would never do very much good. Mm. But uh, later on, you'll find out it did some good. So we left uh, Albuquerque on the, uh, actually on the morning of the 6th, went to San Francisco, spent the day there. It was going to be a night night flight and the interesting thing as to whether so many people wondered did we know there was going to be a war well we didn't but I guess everybody uh, in high places was pretty sure there would be because the last words that the general uh, who gave us a speech to send us off said was a good shooting and good hunting uh, and then uh, we all went out to our airplanes and got ready to go. Now, the plane I was in, was co-piloted of, was the second one off. Uh, that was the, the setup. And we flew for 14-plus hours, almost 15 hours. And we were under radio silence, and we sort of came in... Uh, with good navigation right on right on Pearl Harbor, right on a, uh, with the, the point there, Diamond Head. Oh, Diamond Head, okay. <laughs> yeah. And um, we flew about uh, oh, maybe a mile offshore toward Pearl Harbor, and we got down to uh, about halfway there. We were, of course, looking out, and everybody was gawking. And uh, all of a sudden, I saw oh, six, six or so airplanes flying together, and then they uh, all of a sudden there was ACAC fly, uh, bursting up around them. And we couldn't quite figure that out unless it was some kind of uh, fake uh, ammunition they had that uh, wouldn't do any damage. But we didn't pay it too much uh, attention. Continued on, and we got to. Uh, the channel going down into Pearl Harbor and made our 
really a long, long way sleg going down that channel to Hickam Field. Now, Hickam Field is, uh, for those who don't know, is about a mile or a half a mile maybe even uh, before you get to Pearl Harbor itself. And it's on the right-hand side of the uh, canal. So we uh, got down, as we got closer to uh, where we were going to make our our turn on the final and uh, started to see a lot of black smoke coming up in front of us. And at this point, you still have no idea there's a war on. No. no, You couldn't even tell that those were Japanese airplanes at this point. No, we we didn't have a clue. Well, we assumed that they were our airplanes. We had no reason to think they were Japanese. But uh, we saw this black smoke. Well, two of our crew members had been to, uh, to Hawaii before the preceding year, that uh, was the captain, Captain Swenson, and our navigator, uh, Lieutenant Taylor. So they were somewhat familiar with it. Well, when I saw all the smoke, I began to f- figure out something that was wrong, and I asked Captain Swenson, we called him Swede, and uh, asked him, uh, does he have any idea what all that smoke is from? And uh, he said, yeah, the, this time of year they're burning sugar cane. <laughs> well, I, I should have been smart enough to know that you can't burn sugar cane in the middle of a great big harbor. <laughs> but I just just accepted he knew what he was talking about. And then that almost very shortly after that, a few a minute or two more maybe, uh, we made our we were all watching that smoke, but we made our turn into Hickam Field final approach. And then I got my full good look at Heckham Field. And I saw maybe five or six airplanes burning in different parts of the field. And, of course, that uh, the, the light lit right then that there was a war on. One interesting thing was our flight surgeon for the squadron. Back then, every every squadron had a flight, had its own flight surgeon. And the sl- flight surgeon for our squadron was named Lieutenant Chick. And he was a great uh, cameraman. He was up between us, uh, pilot and myself, all the way in from uh, Diamond Head, uh, taking pictures. And uh, when we were even on our final approach, he was we hadn't told him to sit down or anything. He was still standing up taking pictures. And uh, just about that time, I guess we were maybe, this is just an estimate, 500 feet. <clears throat> when all of a sudden uh, bullets started flying around us and in us, and, uh, uh, and, and we knew we had to continue to land. Well, actually, I, I'll take that back. We didn't know exactly then that we would have to land, but within a couple of seconds, some of the bullets hit the flares that were in our midships, and the flares all went off at once. And, of course, then we had an, an uncontrollable fire and a very large fire burning back there. Um, so now you're landing at Hickam Field. Pearl Harbor is under attack. That's correct, yeah. And you have a fire on board your B-17. Right. Not very uh, good Not very good odds at this point. <laughs> no. Uh, actually, uh, the, oh, about that time... Uh, and Lieutenant Schick, who was still still hadn't dawned on him that there was a war on, uh, got hit in the leg with a bullet. And he said, "Those are real bullets they're shooting. I'm hitting the leg," yeah. and that that was his first uh, awakening. Uh, he later did get out of the airplane with his wounded leg. I don't know how. Of course, I lost, lost track of him, um, and I guess. He made the mistake of running out toward the middle of the field, uh, and the two airplanes or three airplanes, I don't know, I think right now how many, uh, came around in a strafing pass. But as as we hit the ground for landing, uh, it was uh, a, a reasonable landing, <laughs> a little hard. And uh, 
just about that time, the tail actually burned in half. Uh, actually, it wasn't the tail. It was more like midships right behind the wing. So they're and, right around the radio room in that area? Yeah, right just, around the radio room. Okay. That's where the flares were. And uh, so anyhow, we uh, uh, got control of the airplane, bounced a little bit, and then the, then the airplane sort of buckled right back there. <clears throat> Excuse me, and uh, and the the uh, <laughs> plane stopped uh, faster than any time I'd ever been flying in a B-17, and I'd had about a hundred hours as co-pilot by that time, and uh, so anyhow we came to a stop very rapidly. Then I don't know how many feet it was down the runway, and. Uh, as we stopped and didn't have any effect of the wind coming in th- through uh, uh, down into the nose, uh, the fire, the flames, uh, and smoke started coming up rapidly into the cockpit. Uh, one thing that I've always uh, <laughs> gotten a little chuckle out of is is where habit comes into being. Uh, Captain Swenson, instead of hitting the gang bar to knock all the engines out, uh, turned the switches one at a time, which at that time we did. We needed to get there as fast as we could. <laughs> and my job as co-pilot was when we stopped was to set the parking brake, which I did. And uh, that we needed that like a hole in the head. And then uh, by then the cockpit was really full of smoke and I couldn't even see... Uh, Sweet, but we had in that model B-17, B-17C, we had uh, no upper turret by that time. They were later on. Mm-hmm. And uh, we had a, oh, a place for a navigator to take shots or an escape hatch or what, whatever. Anyhow, there was a, an escape hatch up there right in back of the pilot's seats. So... Uh, I got out of the seats, and you could, I could see a little light coming from this hole of the, with, that was already open. The engineer, I'm sure, had opened it to begin with and gotten out. <clears throat> and then uh, maybe Lieutenant Schick went that way, or he could have gone down below and out to where the navigator and bombardier were. But in any event, uh, uh, as you can imagine, I was fairly anxious to get out. And as I got toward the the uh, the the uh, exit. It looked uh, and all of a sudden. I saw this big fanny in the way, with which was Swede trying to get out. So <laughs> I I gave him a boost and and uh, he got him on his way. And then I got out and got on the uh, edge of the wing uh, and and uh, which I don't know how high the B-17 wing was really when when it's at its normal rest, but you have, you can imagine it was at several feet higher up as the wing settled on its uh, uh, just on its wing because there was no longer any uh, back or rear uh, material left, and uh, so I figured the best way to do was to jump off, and uh, so I jumped off and. Uh, I guess I had so much adrenaline in me that uh, I couldn't even feel the, the, you know, the bad shock when I landed, which normally you'd feel with a much shorter right. jump. Well, eight or ten feet probably for you that, that <laughs> yeah. day. Yeah, it was it was at least that. Well, anyhow, the uh, we we uh, I got at the, by that by then the smoke was uh, blowing back a little bit to uh, to the rear because of the uh, obviously the direction of the wind that we were flying into landing into and uh, I ran out of the smoke and just about as time I got out of it I heard uh, and then looked up and saw these airplanes strafing us again so uh, I thought rather than just lay down I'm so close to the wing and the smoke was all now gone downwind, going downwind, that I'd get up uh, on the tire under the engine cell and have that between me and the and the bullets. 
whether it was a good idea or not, I, I still think it was. Uh, but I didn't hear any bullets rattling around. Uh, Lieutenant Chick was out in the middle of the field. We found out later, along with, I guess, a couple of other guys. And uh, he was hit with a ricochet bullet into his head. And uh, he arrived at the hospital, which I'll tell you about a little bit later. But he did uh, die the, the late that afternoon or the following day. Uh, at this anyhow, point, now, excuse me, go ahead. No, at this point, I, 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 I want to remind everybody, we have a, a number of folks who have just tuned in. Mm-hmm. Uh, you were there at Pearl Harbor, uh, December 7th, 1941, as a member of the first air crew to ever be shot down in, in World War II, American air crew, that is. Um, my guest today, of course, is Ernest Roy Reed, and uh, we're so happy. You were a second lieutenant back then. Yeah, and, uh, I was second lieutenant, and six months out of flying school, 21 years old. And uh, Lieutenant Schick, who we were discussing uh, just a, a few brief seconds ago, was a first lieutenant. So you guys were rather young, and it had sort of a cold shock uh, as as the way you uh, you found yourself in the middle of a of an attack, much less the beginning of of World War II here. And, yeah, uh, you're on the ground now, so we'll set the stage again. You're you're on the ground. You're out of the airplane, and you okay. just describe to us how what I think is is rather just really sets the stage. The the place is under attack, and you have a choice of either running out in the middle of the attack or running back to a burning airplane that could explode at any moment. Yeah, that was <laughs> so, about it. But so. fortunately, it was just it was real quick, and uh, then we got back out, and I guess the airplane is left after that strafing attack. <clears throat> because we never saw them anymore. Mm. But uh, there were three of us that ended up together, myself, Lieutenant Taylor, the navigator, and Captain Switzen, the captain of the ship. And uh, we looked at the uh, Swede, and I looked at Taylor, and it looked like he was uh, shot in the neck or something. He had blood all down through the crease of his neck and around, like uh, like like you imagine somebody would be if they'd sliced their throat. Mm. So we got our handkerchiefs out and started mopping away, trying. And, and he wasn't hurt or yelling or anything. And, and we, Swede and I, mopping away. And finally, we traced the blood up to the lobe of his ear, which was half shot off. And that has a tremendous amount of blood in it, apparently, because he he sure had plenty of it coming out. But anyhow, we mopped that up and everything, and and uh, we headed for the first hangar to see if we could get uh, some weapons or something like that. So we went in the hangar, and sure enough, at the rear of the hangar was a master sergeant uh, sitting with a big table in front of him and taking 45s out as fast as he could take them and filling clips of ammunition. So each of us went in and grabbed one and turned around to go out because we wanted to get to the hospital and see uh, how many of our men were wounded. And uh, the sergeant yells out, wait a minute, wait a minute, you got a sign for him. And one of us, I don't even remember who it was now, except one of us yelled out, uh, uh, forget it, there's a war on or something like that. <laughs> you know, and we kept right on going. And uh, so we got outside and saw in back of the hangar uh, were a series of buildings, one of which was a huge barracks. And later on in the second attack, the bar- barracks got hit very badly and lost uh, many lives. Even though all this time had gone uh, from the first attack to the second attack, there were still people, obviously, uh, s- still swarming around in the barracks, and not knowing what to do. But uh, we we saw a man, uh, a couple of men outside, and we asked them, how do we get to the hospital? And he pointed the way. You could actually see it from there, up up a hill and up a parade ground. And there was the hospital with a circular drive going up for the ambulances. So we walked up the parade ground, and no sign of an ambulance or anything, uh, or of anything special going on up there. But as we got there, and we were starting to walk up the curved part of the driveway, an ambulance did come along and stop. 
Well, I thought that uh, that w- must have been picking up Lieutenant Schick, whom we knew was wounded. And uh, so I got by the rear door and uh, waited to, to see if it was Lieutenant Schick. Well, they opened the door, and then the first man they pulled out was really, really a horrible situation because his, one, one of his legs was blown off right, at, right almost at the hip. And I suspect mm. he'd lost so much blood he probably didn't make it. But anyhow, I had uh, back up a little bit to, to my life before that because I had seen a lot of uh, blood and I'd been to three operations because I was thinking of being a doctor. And I'd been to an autopsy, and uh, that's pretty that's pretty gory, and a dissection. And uh, I never expected to be bothered by blood uh, like I was there because that was, uh, you know, the real thing, not controlled. And uh, I felt a little faint, so I just, I knew you had to get your head down. Mm -hmm. I went down, sat on the steps and bent my head down between my knee uh, legs and was there, I don't know, maybe, maybe I stayed there five minutes. It's just guesswork there. But in any events, uh, when I felt okay again, then I got up and uh, now, now I guess every ambulance in the, the hospital alone had already gone out and they were all now starting to come back. And, uh, and several more of them had actually been unloaded. So we went in the hospital, and uh, it was already so crowded that the stretchers were in this long corridor, uh, back right side by side, all the way down the corridor. Mm. And we took one look and figured we can't help anybody in this uh, in this place where. We were just getting in the way. So we left uh, the hospital and decided we'd try to get to the officers club and try to join up with other people there, or people that were stationed there that could tell us what we could do to help. And in back of the hospital was happened to be the officers' quarters for the base. And the first building we came to was uh, the first house we came to was a major acres house and uh, we rang the doorbell to get instructions how to get to the officers club and a maid came to the door and she just stood there looking at us uh, you're pretty I, you're pretty bloodied up at this point <laughs> you. yeah well I, I forgot <laughs> to tell you I lost uh, a lot of my hair just by a singe as as I got out of that escape pass, there was a big puff of flame, which mm. didn't hurt me a bit, but it managed to singe uh, all, uh, a lot of my hair out. And it, Lieutenant Taylor was the first one that mentioned that to me. So but, there's, uh, a, it's a, there's a fine-looking Motley crew standing at this lady's door. There is, yeah. And, you know, it's interesting. we had blood all over us from, from uh, Taylor's ear. Well, and, and, and no one really knows at this point. That's what I find so interesting is that there's there's this sense of of, well, it, everything is fine, let's keep with it. There's not a sense that we're really under attack at this point. Not not with many, many of the people, because uh, the, Mrs. Aker's voice came up uh, out of the, wherever she was and said to the maid, uh, "What's uh, who's at the door? What's the matter? And then the maid spoke up and she said, well, there's three men here, and I think they've been in an accident. So Mrs. Mm. Taylor, Mrs. Uh, Aker came from, running up there and looked at us and said, oh, you poor man. He said, come in, I'll get you some brandy. And uh, we said, we weren't in any accident. We've just been shot down as a war on. And she had, uh, she sort of poo-pooed that. And we literally had to take her outdoors and show her the airplanes piling down to the, uh, mm. uh, into Pearl Harbor. And many of them were using the canal uh, you know, as a strafing point to get low enough to where they wanted to drop torpedoes and stuff. So at that point, she finally believed it because there were plenty of zeros to look at and then their round red rondels. Uh, 
believe it or not, she still had her two children out playing in the yard. We hadn't seen them when we came in. And of course she ho hollered to them and got them in right away. But that's how, that's the type of reaction I'm sure many people were having on the base uh, and, and in town that way. So anyhow, we went in and uh, I asked her if I could uh, use her telephone to charge her cable home to my wife. And she said, certainly, and so I did. And it uh, uh, was M. Safe Wire Mother Love Roy, which Shirley got that night. And uh, when we were just about that time, the second attack, or the second wave, so the second mm -hmm. attack started taking place. And there were a lot of bombs coming down really near the hospital and near the living quarters. Uh, but, uh, we didn't know much about bombing attacks, but we figured there was a huge open, I mean, uh, dining room table, a very, very solid looking thing. And we figured, well, that's the best thing we've got to get out of the way. So all of us, uh, the three of us and the maid and Mrs. Aker and the two kids <laughs> were all curled up underneath the, uh, the table, and uh, when we finally the noise stopped, we figured it was okay, and we came, of course all came out. Mm -hmm. And shortly thereafter, we we left that house and found our way down to the uh, club. Met met a lot of our other crew members who by that time had landed. The uh, I mentioned that we were the second one to take off. That was our position. But the first guy that took off was a little smarter than we were, and he he didn't like that black smoke coming up at all. So he went up and circled, and he saw us get shot down. Mm. So uh, so that uh, then he took off to go to the other side of the island, and he was attacked. And uh, uh, several men wounded, no one killed but wounded. I should point out here, too, that... Uh well, you had guns on board. You had no ammunition on board for the flight. Oh, yeah, that's a good point. We had we were supposed to pick up our ammunition in Hawaii for the rest of the way over, and the, and the reason was for the extra weight it would have been right. to no purpose going over to Hawaii. So, uh, yeah, I'm glad you reminded me of that. But uh, so you were really sitting ducks up there. You couldn't fire back. You had no no, no way to to do anything other than to land or no. That's all we try and duck yeah. into a cloud. I guess at that point. Yeah. But. but this other airplane uh, went to the other side of the island and uh, and uh, the it was a pretty short field. Maybe that was what caused it, or maybe this plane was shot up pretty much. I know it was shot up quite a bit. But in any event, it it. Uh, Saint came to a sort of a crash at the end of the runway, and everybody got out, but there were several men wounded on that airplane. We had um, a number of airplanes that that had landed just kind of wherever they could at that point. I'm I'm assuming. Well, there were yeah, there were, that that was one of them, and there was really only one other one that landed uh, where he could not. He landed on a golf course, <laughs> and uh, flew flew out a couple of days later. Uh, but the rest of them all ended up now coming into Hickam. Uh, Major Landon, which was the commanding officer, uh, his navigator managed to get him very far north of where he should have been. And uh, he got under attack by Japanese returning from Pearl Harbor. I mean, that's how far up right. he was toward their ships. Mm. Uh, but they didn't do. Uh, I don't think they've got any enough shots in to get get him wounded, and, right. uh, anybody wounded on that plane. Well, I want to so, pause. I want to pause briefly for a quick break, and then I want to come back with the conclusion of this story. And if you would, if you would do us the kind favor of telling us a few Poncho Barn stories, I'd love to hear them. If you could stick around <laughs> with us just for a few more minutes, my guest today is Roy Reed, and we'll be right back after this. We've got your six. This is Warbird Radio. Tune in. Take off. 
And welcome back to Warbird Radio Live. I'm Matt Jolly. My guest today is Roy Reed. He was an eyewitness to Pearl Harbor. He was actually the co-pilot on board the first American airplane, I believe it had been shot down during World War II. And that was a B-17C model. But, uh, Mr. Reed, thank you again for uh, for being with us this morning and sharing this story. You know, it. I, I told you this the other day when we spoke, that your story really reads like a movie script. I mean, it, it, it's just an amazing story. Uh, one of many that happened that day, and, and I want to personally thank you for your service and thank you for uh, all of the efforts that, that you made. I mean, you've truly, as you know, you, you truly saved the world back then, and that's a, that's a pretty neat thing to do, and, and uh, we wouldn't be here doing this show if it, if it hadn't been for the guys uh, and gals of your generation. So thank you for, for that. Uh, you, you were mentioning that when we, when we left off there that uh, where everybody had landed— and I'm yeah. guessing that that it hasn't really sunk in yet, uh, just how close you came to uh, to meeting your maker that day. But uh, they, I think it did set in probably when you, when you went back to see the airplane. Oh yeah, uh, the uh, following morning I went I went back to and climbed up into the. By then the tail, which had had a few stringers still holding on to the body of the airplane had been bulldozed away. Actually, they bulldozed it away uh, right then. Um, about one hour after we had landed, they bulldozed it away. But anyhow, the next morning I climbed up into the cockpit and uh, I told you about the piece of lead they put behind the pilot and myself. And then we had sort of uh, laughed at the idea of such a small piece just from the waist up. And uh, uh, lo and behold, I found four bullet holes in that mm. uh, in that lead. So uh, that that uh, certainly saved my life, or probably saved my life. Do you ever uh, do you ever keep in touch with uh, Mrs. Aker or her uh, or her children, who you spent so much time under the table with that day? No, uh, but I did. I did meet. Uh, Oh, not many years ago now, maybe six years ago. Uh, I did meet Lieutenant Schick's son. Hmm. And Lieutenant Schick uh, never saw his son, or his son never saw his father. Uh, and uh, his son was invited over, as was I, to a dedication of the what was then a hospital to be the Schick General Clinic. And uh, now this is uh, at uh, at Pearl Harbor there on Hickam Field. At, at, yeah, at Hickam Field, and mm. so um, I went over and uh, and met met uh, met Bill Schick. Uh, he was named for his father, Junior, and uh, he he was pretty bitter about the Army and the Air Corps and uh, all of that stuff when he arrived. But by the time he left, uh, uh, he had an entirely different, uh, completely different picture. And uh, I, I stayed with him as much as I could and had dinner with him, and, and we went breakfast sometimes. And So uh, Are there any since, of the, uh... since then, I, let me just say this. So since sure. then, uh, uh, he, he lives in Chicago, and... Uh, he usually comes over once a year to visit some friends in in uh, Florida, where we lived for a long time. And he came actually came up here, which is way out of his way, uh, when we lived a little bit north of here, up in Jasper, Georgia. Hmm. So uh, we have become good friends, and uh, and uh, I think he got all over his bad feelings. So. I was glad to see that. You mentioned Poncho Barnes. Did you want right? To I, I do, but I, I wanted to. That? I was curious oh. if uh, if any of it. You mentioned that he was taking photographs. He was he was a, a photographer. Are there any of those photographs that are still around of uh, of that mission on December seventh, or did that was that lost in the airplane? And it looks like we uh, lost our connection here with Mister uh, with Mister Reed here. We'll we'll try him right back and just uh, see if we can reconnect here for our. <laughs> remaining story. Anyhow, my, my guest today is Roy Reed, uh, who was the first American 
oh, I should say, a member of the first air crew, American air crew, that was shot down uh, over Pearl Harbor. We're going to take a, a brief a brief break here to try and reconnect with him, and we'll have him uh, with the conclusion of his story and some great stories about Poncho Barnes right after this. Stay with us. Radio. We're calling next week's Big Band Jump program Moments in Music, anecdotes about the production of some of the recordings and the change in careers of some of the recording artists. Moments in Music, the stories behind the music on the next Big Band Jump, and we hope you'll be with us. Hi, this is Mike Chilson of the RC Scale Builder Show. If you're interested in radio control scale modeling, you should check us out at rcscalebuilder.com. It's a great community that offers built threads, tips and tricks, aircraft walkarounds, free plans, and much more. You can find us at www.rcscalebuilder.com. Hope to see you there. The RC Scale Builder Show broadcast weekly right here on Warbird Radio. And welcome back to Warbird Radio Live. I'm Matt Jolly. It is live. There is no uh, <laughs> there there is no pre-recording on this show, so bear with us here as we're trying to get Mr. Reed uh, uh, back on the telephone here. Uh, Mr. I don't Reed, know what are you there? Happened. Well, that's fine. It's all right. It's just uh, that's live radio. You know how that goes. <laughs> it's, it's, we just roll with the punches here. This is a. Were there any photographs left though of uh, Lieutenant Schick's mission there that day that he? Or were those lost in the airplane? Uh, the, the photographs that he was that he was taking on approach. And again, we lost him. This must be a great question here. <laughs> try him, try him right back here. The uh, the old uh, the old magic here of uh, live radio. I will point out to you that uh, later on this week, God willing, without technical difficulties, we will have uh, Mike Chilson on the program, who. Uh, is going to be discussing some stuff about Jerry Bates and uh, everything else with the Jerry Bates plans. And then tomorrow, I'm hoping that we, we have a special guest on tomorrow. You know him as a is a Mr. Reed. Are you there? Yeah, I'm trying a new phone. Oh, okay. Well, that's fine. Well, I was just telling our uh, our audience that uh, the guys that tomorrow we're going to have Pat Epps on the program, hopefully, to talk about the new restaurant that he's opening up there in Atlanta, the 57th Fighter Group. So oh, uh, that's going to be that? that's Pat Epps uh, from up there at uh, the Peachtree DeCab Airport, but uh, oh, pretty uh-huh. cool stuff. So, were there any photographs remaining of uh, Lieutenant Schick's mission there that morning? No, no. Uh, now you've talked about when we went back for the ceremonies, or well, no. But when 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 he was you said, you mentioned that he was up, right? Or did any of those survive, or were they all lost uh, with the airplane? They they were all lost, and we think mm. that his whole camera was stolen. Wow, I wonder if that's that's a shame. It's too bad those don't exist anymore. That, oh yeah, exactly. that would have been terrific. Yeah. Well, let's let's switch gears here because you you actually flew. I I, I was uh, failed to mention this. You actually flew forty nine combat missions throughout the Pacific Theater in World War Two. Um, right, mm-hmm. and uh, you you went on to have quite a quite a career after that. Uh, and what was the Army Air Corps later becoming the the Air Force? Right. But uh, you you were you were sort of in in that magic time period. It seemed like, and and you you really got to meet some of the the the, the folk heroes, if you will, of uh, uh-huh. of the Air Force and of that of the Army Air Corps and of that whole generation. And one of those uh, being Poncho Barnes uh, <laughs> at her Happy Bottom Riding Club. You you were there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was I was uh, actually stationed for another tour on Guam, and uh, something had come up where they needed some me to. I was in operations there then, and uh, I was a major, and uh, they they needed uh, someone to go to Muroc Dry Lake uh, for a, a TDY for a special project, which I was picked to go to that. So. I was there at Muroc Dry Lake, and there's not much to do except when you're not working, except to count cranes of sand. <laughs> or go and, to the De Poncho's place. <laughs> and then I found and discovered that it was a person named Poncho Barnes right. that I became very well acquainted with over the weeks. And uh, she is, is the most amazing woman I have ever met uh, to this date. And I also... I uh, frankly thought she was the ugliest woman I'd ever met, <laughs> but she was sure the most interesting one. 
Mm. And uh, so you, you, you want me to tell the live audience some of the stuff? Oh, I, I think they can handle it. I, for the, <laughs> I mean, this was, this was, she ran sort of a, a watering hole for, uh, for the likes of, uh, well, all of the test pilots and, and folks who were uh, based out there at Muroc. And she was also, in her own right, quite a pilot. And uh, and early aviatrix and race pilot. That's correct. She flew uh, and had many races with Amelia Earhart, for example. And she also then got into the movie industry and uh, flew uh, uh, when they needed to make, uh, uh, you know, airplanes get into the pictures. So she was very active in the uh, movie industry and knew practically everybody in it. In fact, she knew practically everybody <laughs> who counted anywhere mm. so uh she was she was quite a character she she uh was somewhat limited in her english because she had used she always used four letter words only <laughs> that's so, a real talent <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> so uh, that was very interesting and and i was of course uh about 22 then i guess 23 maybe and uh, I thought I was pretty sophisticated, having been all around in Australia and all over the place by then. But uh, I sure learned that I didn't know from nothing <laughs> when you were around that <laughs> crowd. Uh, I don't know if there's any people who are old enough to, I, I mentioned to you last night, to uh, know the star Eric von Stroheim, who was a very famous movie actor at that time and took the part of uh, Rommel of the Desert. But in any event, uh, he was a character by himself, and he was there visiting, uh, and he had a, uh, a nice-looking girl with him who was Denise Darcel, who was also an actress. And uh, one story about the Pancho might be of interest to you. After a couple of weeks went by, she said, hey, Roy, you, you, you're coming here every night, you and your buddies, and, and uh, you've never invited us over to the base. And I said, I didn't <laughs> even thought of it. And I said, oh, I'm sorry. And so I made arrangements with the base commander. I mean, I wanted to warn him. <laughs> I, I found out later he really knew her, but he pretended he didn't. Mm. And so... We got together this group of uh, uh, this friend of mine who was a lieutenant colonel. He and I hung out all the time after work. And uh, so he and I uh, sort of arranged the, uh, the affair. And the only ones from were Poncho Barnes and her husband, who, who I, when I first met him, I thought he was the first gigolo I'd ever met. <laughs> and because she was a fairly good-looking guy, and uh, she, as I mentioned, wasn't. But anyhow, we took them to the bay, and oh, and Eric Van Stroheim and, and Denise Darcel went with us. So we went in, and I saw the base commander and his wife at the table, and I said, told Poncho, come on over and meet. Uh, and she didn't let on she knew him either, and I know dar- darn well from later stuff that she didn't know. And so I took them over and introduced them. Uh, the, the funny part was when Eric von Stroheim got there, he was a typical German officer that you can imagine with the bending at the waist, taking her hand, kissing her hand, and then clicking his heels. <laughs> <laughs> right in front of the base that commander was, there. Huh? That was a laugh. Huh? <laughs> right in front of the base commander. Huh? That's, that's pretty... Well, yeah, he was he was meeting his wife, you see, right. <laughs> and that was he was doing her an honor. But anyhow, that that was one episode. And uh, tell tell us the story one, about, about Jimmy. One was, pardon? Tell tell us the story about Jimmy. I want to hear that one again. Well, oh yeah, uh, Poncho had a had a rule that when you came in the front door, you hung your hat on the door along with your rank. It was no rank ever to be seen and or to be used mm. in her property. So um, I, I actually, unfortunately, wasn't at this particular episode, but the, the young guy that was told me about it, he said he was there 
and they're all sitting at this table. We had a long table out in the sort of like a patio, and all the people that were there that night uh, would, would be sitting at the table and uh, d- drinking away. I guess we were drinking up all her hooch because she was giving it away all the time. <laughs> and uh, anyhow, this this guy was sitting at the table, and uh, a new person came in, and uh, he was he wasn't paying any attention to him. And the poncho was walking down the side of the table with this new guy, and uh, introducing him as to, to everybody that was there. And he made the turn at the end of the table and came up where this guy was sitting. And he was busy talking with his friends, he said. And uh, and he and Pancho says, uh, "What well, I forget this guy's name." He said, "This is uh, this is Jimmy." And and then he gave this guy's introduction. Jimmy said, "Hi, how are you?" And and moved to the next case. And when he got around to the other side of the table, this guy said he looked up and it, and it was Jimmy Doolittle. <laughs> so, <laughs> So he was pretty shocked with that one, but that was funny. But that's the kind of people she knew. One one little story, I don't know how much time you've got, but uh, she and her husband, her husband told me this one. Uh, she and her husband were driving along somewhere or other, and they picked up a hitchhiker, a, a, a sergeant, young sergeant, and uh, they went to eat lunch, and they took him in, bought him lunch, and Poncho pulls out her flask and uh, starts pouring it in a little, little bit, a little bit of water, a lot of hooch. <laughs> and a, the owner came flying over and he said, "You can't, you can't. This is a dry county. You can't have liquor in here. It's against the law." And Poncho says, "Buzz off," or something equally <laughs> as curt. <laughs> and uh, so the guy went and called the cop, called the sheriff. The sheriff came and very nicely, uh, according to her husband, uh, told Poncho she'd have to put the flask away and it wasn't allowed and all that. And she just told the sheriff to go jump in the river also. So he grabbed her and took her to jail. And uh, her, <laughs> her husband says, so, so we get to the jail. And Poncho says, do I get one call? And he said, yes. So she calls the governor <laughs> of <laughs> California, who, who I don't know who it was at that time. And, uh, and very shortly thereafter, she hung up. The phone rang. The sheriff answered it and said, yes, sir, yes, sir, yes, sir, and uh, let, her, let her go. So, <laughs> <laughs> Share with us just one, if you will, about Curtis E. LeMay. You actually briefed him a number of times. You actually worked in the SAC command. You had quite a career. We could spend three hours together. But uh, <laughs> your your experiences with LeMay, I think, oh, probably, with LeMay? probably measured up with what everybody else, his experiences with LeMay. Yeah, were. other than he was the biggest pain in the neck I ever knew. <laughs> uh, he also, of course, was a, a well-known uh, uh well-known character, right. uh, both over in the in Europe and then over in the Pacific. But I worked for him uh, on a, my second tour over to Guam. Uh, this was obviously before I was sent back on a, on a temporary duty deal. Uh, but but uh, I, I briefed him every night. I had one shift of the war room. I think it was an eight-hour shift. And uh, so I had one shift of that, and I had the night one, and that's when an awful lot of the missions, of course, went off. And uh, so every night I briefed him as to what was going on, and uh, that was that. Then I'd pass him in the daytime in the street. I'd salute him, and he would return the salute, but he'd never say, hi, Roy, how you doing, or anything. Not not once in the whole... It was all business uh, huh? <laughs> time I was there. Did he ever oh. acknowledge that that I, I, I was a person? And you'd think he had never met me. Mm. <laughs> at, at but the, you briefed uh, him every day. Then. Briefings. Well, I briefed him every day, yeah. And if you're ever up this way again, I'll tell you some more hairy stories about Poncho. <laughs> some, some we probably can't share uh, on the air, I'm guessing, <laughs> right? <laughs> I think so. <laughs> well, that's all the time we have for this episode, but please, like, Subscribe and follow us here on Warbird Radio. 
for more stories like this one. Stories that matter. Stories that often don't get told. Thank you again for helping us out by telling your friends and, of course, by even signing up for our newsletter here at WarbirdRadio.com. We'll talk to you again real soon with more great content, not only from our archive, but new shows coming up and coming online very, very soon. Thanks again for being here. So long for now. Supporting bees the old-fashioned way. This is Warbird Radio. Tune in. Take off.